All right. You don't remember Bill in your prayers. He's off moving people in Amarillo. How's that going, Debbie? Going good? Good. Okay. So he's doing well. Morning, Sam. Sam and Jennifer had a hard VBS day yesterday. Or Jennifer did. I don't know if Sam was here or not. <laughs> no. Jennifer had a hard VBS day. Well, starting to move into a part in Corinthians that is uh, where Paul really kind of gets to the crux of the, of the matter here, information that he's heard, and he uh, and he's upset enough about it that really he just goes into it real, uh, real bluntly. And this is a really interesting case, you know. It's actually reported there's sexual immorality among you of a kind that does not occur even among pagans. A man has his father's wife, and you are proud, he says. You know, it's kind of interesting. In the Greek, there's a couple different ways this plays out. Uh, wife or concubine, but most people think it's wife. Um, you know, apparently he has married his, his father's wife, which we would assume would be his stepmother at this, at this juncture. So he has married his stepmother, because it doesn't say his mother, but his father's wife. So... You know, this is a, we don't really know the whole situation. We know this was reported to Paul. We know, we don't know what's going on here, but apparently, uh, they don't, apparently they're all right with it. And Paul's not here, obviously. And uh, Paul kind of says, you, you know, shouldn't you rather have been filled with grief and, and have put out of your fellowship the man who did this? So it's one of those cases, and Paul's going to start getting into sexual immorality here and and that type of thing. But this is kind of the crux of kind of what starts this. Um, problems in Corinth, right? Um, we don't know, like I said, we don't know the situation behind this. We, it'd be nice if we did, but we don't. We just know that that's the case at this present time, is that this has happened. And Paul, of course, sees this and should see this as something that's horrendously wrong. And he expects the church also to see this wrong. Um, so what, you know, so when you first look at this on the surface, uh, what would you, what would you think here? I mean, we don't have a lot of information. So what would you, uh, what would you think? Kind of read between the lines here. Um, how would you perceive this, this, this situation here? What's happened here, do you think? Um, has his father divorced this woman? Is he married this woman is he uh just with this woman maybe his father hadn't divorced this woman yet how would you how would you uh what do you what do you see in this you know yeah right yeah, it's kind of interesting how he puts that up there, right? How this was really a bad deal. This wasn't just like, you know, I don't think, and I think you could look at this, oh, well, you know, maybe his father had divorced this woman, the son had married this woman. I don't think that's what we're talking about here. You know, I think we're talking about a real adulterous, incestuous, more or less. I think Paul looks at it that way. Of course, it's not really by blood, blood, but a real adulterous situation here, I think, you know. Yeah, yeah, still his wife, right? Yeah. Not honoring your father for sure, right? <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, this is really one of those situations, I think, if you really just, and like, and like Billy says, not even the pagans do it, right? So you kind of get the idea that this is a real adulterous uh, situation here, and apparently they're all right with it, right? Um, he said you should have been filled with grief and put him out of, of fellowship. He, Paul says, I've already passed judgment as if I were present. 
Um, you know, in other words, Paul says, I've already, this is a bad enough deal that I've already, I've already passed judgment on it. I've already made the decision, you know. And the decision Paul makes here is to put him out, right? This is a, uh, put him out of fellowship. Um, you know, I think in the church today, we're probably maybe more lenient than maybe Paul would have been when it comes to stuff, you know. I'm pretty sure we are. Um, Paul says, you know, he says, I'm with you in the spirit, right? He says, when, you're, when you assemble, I'm with you in spirit. The power of the Lord is present. Hand this man over to Satan so that the sinful nature may be destroyed and the spirit saved. This is the same thing he says in 1 Timothy about Emmaus, Alexander, and Emmaus. Same thing Paul says. Turn him over to Satan, right? Turn him over to Satan so their sinful nature may be destroyed and his spirit saved on the day of the Lord. So Paul doesn't see it as something that can't be rectified, but he sees it as something that's bad enough that needs to be addressed. And uh, apparently they're not addressing this whatsoever. Apparently they're proud. I don't know why they're proud. I really don't understand that statement. But, but um, no, it means basically to put him out into the world, you know, disfellowship him, put, kick him out into the world more or less. It's a difficult idea. <laughs> the idea is eventually, you know, he would repent and come back, you know. Eventually, if he sees the error of his ways, if you throw it out there, that he'll repent and come back, you know. That, that's, that's, I think, the theory there. Right. In other words, you're going to cast him out into the world, and if he wants back in, then, you know, uh, still possible for him to be saved, right? But at this particular point, he's not in a saved state. I think we can make that decision, right? Because he's committed this, he's basically did this, this sin, and Paul's not willing to let that go, and they shouldn't be willing to let it go either. Um, we, you know, we deal with situations in the church, obviously. Um, you know, and I think it's, it's never easy, right, uh, to deal with, with problems like that, be that adultery or be that, any kind of sexual sin or sin in general, it's very difficult to deal with that. It's nice when people are repentant, when people truly are sorry of what they did, when people are ready to come back. That's nice. That's a wonderful thing when people are that way. But a lot of times people aren't. A lot of times people don't care. A lot of times people would rather stay in that state than to come back to God. They just would. You know, they're just going to do what they're going to do, and they don't care. You know, and that's a hard situation, isn't it, uh, for us to be in. It reflects badly upon the church. If people know it in the community, if people know what's going on and somebody's a member of a congregation, then it reflects badly on the church, ultimately reflects badly on the Lord. So it's, uh, this is really a hard thing. But Paul's really stern about this because he understands the ramifications of sexual sin. And it's big, right? Um, destroys families destroys homes destroys people i've seen it many times in my life you've probably seen it many times in your life i come from a divorced family um know a lot about that situation now i didn't know when i was eight years old and so it's pretty disturbing to me <laughs> but <laughs> but i uh, but the truth is is that those things tear things apart it just does um our desires lust you know, there's so many things that really can tear us apart in this world and can tear us away from God in this world. And, you know, sometimes we just want to do it so bad, we just do it and we don't care, you know? And that's just a bad place to be, bad place to be. I just don't understand sometimes. I guess it's more, isn't it? It's, I don't know. I guess I'm rambling here because I had a really good friend. Well, not a really good friend, but. I really liked him, and uh, down at the, down where our boat was, down at the dock, and I found out he committed suicide yesterday, and I just, I'm just, you know, I just don't know what puts people in those places, you know, I just, and I just, and it wasn't a sexual thing with him, but I talked to the, the lady that he was with, and, and, um, you know, the emotions she was obviously going through, and he was, and it was more alcoholism, I think, and just mental instability, you know, but. But I think those things that we 
you know, the world has a way of getting us, you know, and, and some people, maybe it's this, and this is a big poll. And I think sexual sin in our society is maybe one of the biggest things we have right now. I mean, it's just so everywhere, you know, it's just literally everywhere. Um, but, you know, there's just so many things that pull us away from God. Um, and those things are, and I, and I just kind of, I guess the idea of being steadfast in the Lord, the idea of saying, you know, I'm going to do with the Lord, live my life for the Lord regardless of what happens, is a, it's a really big statement to make in life. Um, you know, but Paul, he, he uh, and I guess I'm kinda, I kind of shifted gears on you, so hold on a minute. Let me back up. Uh, let me get back here because I shifted gears in the middle of this. So I went into Matthew, right? And this is kind of getting into my sermon this morning, actually, but it's all right. So, you know, what did, what should they have done here, right? I mean, this is, Matthew's a really, Matthew 18 is a really interesting little piece of scripture because, you know, there's no church in, in Matthew 18. It doesn't exist. I mean, we're still under, Christ is still alive. We're still under Judaism. But Matthew, this is the only place in the Gospels that we see the word church is right here, Matthew 18. It doesn't occur anyplace else. Of course, the word is ecclesia. It means assembly. But it's interesting that, that Matthew uses it here because, and Gary and I were talking about this passage uh, the other day, you know, and he said, why do you think that it says church here? You know, because, like I said, there is no church here. And, you know, I, said, I think the reason is is because, you know, Matthew wrote, wrote Matthew in the 60s, you know, 60 A.D., a long time after Jesus. And I think looking back, when Matthew was writing this, he was like, this has church application. I really think Matthew intended this path. That's my opinion. I don't think Matthew intended this passage to be about the church, not about Judaism. I really think even though the church didn't exist yet here, I think when Matthew was going back into Jesus' words, he says, this is about the church. And I, I think that's kind of, maybe that's a big stretch, but I believe it's true. And you know, the truth is, is that this is a, this is a, this is a uh, passage that tells us how we should do this, how, how they should have approached this guy, what they should have done to this person in, in Corinth. Um, and whether or not they did this, you know, I don't know. But it's, this isn't a beat somebody up passage. It's not a go show somebody how wrong they are passage because we should never, you know, isn't it interesting? Paul says, you should have had grief over this, didn't he? He said, you should have had grief over this. You know, he didn't say you should have been mad you should have been you know you should have went with pitchforks and rods and you know kicked him out of the church you know that's not what paul said he said you should have been grieved over it you know um, when we lose a brother or sister when somebody's overtaken in sin we sh that should grieve us you know we should be grieved about that and it's interesting sometimes i don't think that's our attitude but that's what paul says and here this isn't a beat somebody up passage this is a passage to to get your brother back is exactly what this is. You go in private and you talk to him. And if he listens, what does is, what is, what is Jesus says? right? These are Jesus' words. If he listens, you have won your brother over, right? In other words, the idea is not to, to hurt somebody. If we would literally, I know I'm getting into my sermon, but I'm sorry. This is really on my heart today. You're going to get it here. You're going to get it my sermon. You're probably going to get it from me for a while. So, but if we have a problem with somebody, we need to talk, you know? I mean, I don't know how else to say it. Grow up, you know? I mean, I hate to be that way, but I'm just telling you. Grow up. You know, we're not four-year-olds, right? I mean, if we have a problem with somebody, we need to be man enough to go talk to them about it. Why wouldn't we do that? Why don't we do that? Why don't we just do what God says to do, you know? What's our problem here? Why don't we want to go talk to somebody? It's easier to talk to somebody else, isn't it? Yeah. And we, it's easier for us to talk to somebody else. How wrong is that as a Christian? How wrong is it for us to talk about a brother or sister in Christ to somebody else before we go talk to that brother and sister in Christ? Well, maybe we are, but... 
You know, the truth is, is that if we really love somebody, you know, if you really love somebody, like we should love each other, we should be able to talk. I mean, shouldn't we? I mean, yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, that might be a little different situation when it's with your wife. You might need to talk to somebody else about that, you know. But so they can tell you how wrong you are before you tell your wife, and she can tell you how wrong you are. You probably ought to kind of buffers it a little bit, you know, kind of buffers it a little bit. Right, and it's hard to approach that, and you know, and you're right. We have to be careful, you know, how, how we say, you know, how we talk, what our body language is. You know, are we mad? We don't want to go in mad. You know, you never want to go in mad. You never want to go in upset. You want to come in with that, you know, you want to come in with that, I love you, we need to talk, you know. Um, yeah. Yeah, I agree. It's good sometimes to feel out with somebody you trust, somebody, a confidant, somebody that's going to, somebody you can trust, you know, and say, this is what's going on, this is the situation, what do you think? I mean, that's all right to do that, to make sure you're right, to make sure that you're grounded in what you're thinking. You know, that's good to do that. Yeah. Right. Yeah, and I don't, and I'm right, and I think when you look specifically at this, and it says you catch them in a sin, you know, and that's one case, but you know, to me, this is broader than just that. It's more like, you know, if you do something to hurt me, if you do something that I don't think's right, if there's something you say, maybe I heard in passing that upsets me. You know, I have a responsibility to clarify that with you before I make that decision, don't I? I mean, as Christians, we should be on each other's side. Does that make any sense? You know, we should always think the best until we know the worst. You know, we should never think the worst. And I'm guilty of that. You know, I'm guilty of that very same thing. And that happened to me just in the last couple of weeks. Guilty of that very same thing. And I was ashamed of myself because I, something happened and immediately I was judging. I didn't know the whole situation. I had not talked to everybody. Immediately I was judging it. Immediately and I was wrong. And I was so ashamed that I did that because that's not the person that I should be. And it's not the person you should be. You know, if you see somebody, a, another brother or sister, something, and you think that's maybe in a bad situation or something going on, you should err to the side of that brother or sister until you know the truth. You know, we should always be on each other's side. We shouldn't be against each other, right? We shouldn't be the person, well, did you see brother so-and-so doing that? Why? We should never do that. Our sister so-and-so doing this, why would we ever do that? We should be on each other's side here, you know? Yeah. Well, that's because it's always easier. You know, and I think social media, you know, is, is the worst. I mean, you know, the truth is, you know, I see them post all the time. People are bashing somebody or alluding to something, and I'm like, what on earth, you know? I mean, 
I don't need those kind of friends. <laughs> you know what I mean? I just don't, you know. I don't need that kind of drama in my life. I mean, you just need to, you know, at some point, we can't just, we have to address the problem, and we have to do it with one another, whether it's in our family or our church family, we have to be able to talk. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I don't think you should take that to the church. No, I don't think in that case that's something you should necessarily. Right. To go to, to go to all three measures. Right. But like the first two, maybe you are okay. Yeah. If you hurt my feelings. Yeah. I just think that, you know, if you, the idea here in this particular passage is the idea of sin and the idea of winning your brother back, of making them listen to you. But then in the end, like it happened in Corinth, um, in the end, what does it say? Somebody that's in an obvious sin, public sin, somebody that's not repentant, doesn't want to come back, what does it say? Treat them like a pagan. In Judaism, what, how do they treat a pagan and a tax collector? Shut them out, right? They weren't allowed in the temple, weren't even allowed in the outer courts of the temple. They were absolutely ostracized in Judaism. If he comes back. Yeah, Paul's idea is if you throw him over to Satan, in other words, let him, you know, if he won't turn from what he's doing, if you let him go with it, eventually, hopefully God will intervene. Hopefully he'll see the error of his ways. Hopefully he'll repent and he'll come back to who he needs to be. That's the idea. Right, but the idea here is that he becomes disassociated. He's basically no longer your brother or no longer your sister until, that, until that's rectified. And that's really, really hard for us as Christians, right? Really, really hard for us to uh, probably to wrap our head around. But, you know, these are sins that jeopardize the soul, you know. And, and, there, and Paul will really get more into this as we go, right? Uh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> right. Oh, I totally agree. Yeah, when we, and you know, we do do that. And I, and I actually, one of my nephews, that's where I was with him. I was to the point. But, you know, he did. I mean, the truth is, I had somebody tell me time, people can't truly change. And I said, you're truly wrong. I said, because I guarantee you, people can truly change. Uh, that's what God's about, about changing us, making us better than than we're supposed to be, you know, and I think that we forget that sometimes, and, you know, we go through bad patches, bad places, bad decisions, you know, as long as there's breath, there's hope, God gives us that hope, and, you know, we just have to strive to be, I think it's right, you know, Maryland really said it right, you know, we're all, you know, we're all sinners, I mean, we're all, you know, <laughs> We're all lost without Christ, plain and simple, you know, and, and um, we have to kind of approach life that way with people, you know. I'm a work in progress, Lord knows, and uh, I think we all are, should be. We should all be work in progresses. We should all be trying to, to, to be better, trying to be better us or more like Christ, I would like to say. Yeah. yeah. 
Oh, I know. Yeah. Uh, well, what's the last thing you saw? Yeah. He talked about someone uh, really committed a sin oh. against you, and it's bad. Yeah. Right, huh? Yeah. Yeah, it's a bad sin, and Black Buck says though he can't sin against you, can he sin against God, right? You know? But the problem is, is that in life, in my experience in the church, this doesn't happen that often. Somebody that sins that bad against you, some mortal sin against you personally, that really doesn't, not in my life, I can really tell you that doesn't happen that much but the other thing the smaller things happen all the time and most people that I know that leave the church over things is not necessarily big sins it's over little things and that got blown out of proportion and never got reconciled and and um, and so I guess you know I I guess when I see this you're right I understand the big implication, the mortal sin, the sexual sin involved here in Paul's. But in my mind, I'm sitting here thinking, but, you know, doesn't the same type of thing apply even to little things? You know, we need to communicate, we need to talk, we need to, we need to work this out, right? Because our souls depend on it. Just as much as this big sin kicking him out for a little thing to happen and somebody to leave the church, either way... Or, it's a soul, right? I mean, either way, our souls depend upon it. Oh, I, no, but if you did, yeah, sure, I told you. Yeah, I'll tell you anything. I don't care. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. And why do we do that? Because we love each other. Yeah. Because we want to have a relationship with each other. And you can't have a relationship with somebody if you if you don't work things out. You just can't. Right. Yeah. 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 Oh, come on. Don't say it. <laughs> right. Yeah, it's about our souls. It's not about necessarily our friendship in the end, you know, and I think that's, and I think that's a big thing. You know, sometimes that's, that's true. I mean, you might not like me, and that might be all right, but, but I still want you to go to heaven, and, and, you know, and I hope that we can get along, you know. I hope, you know, <laughs> I just, you know, I, I think that's okay in life, you know. I, you know me. I mean, I believe agreeing to disagree <coughs> a lot of times is the best thing on earth, you know. We can do that. Yeah.
Yeah, well, I think that when you, uh, you know, the truth is, is that, you know, in the church, you know, we need to rely on one another. I think the worst thing about suicide, the worst thing about getting to that point is that every time that I've been involved in this in my entire life, I'm going to tell you, every time I've ever been involved in this in my entire life, I had no idea they were going to do it until they did it. I just didn't, you know. I mean, I, <laughs> you know, and I think it's, that's probably the hardest thing about it. Like you said, I mean, if he would have reached out, I'd have been, you know, I wish he would have reached out. I wish I would have known. He knew I was a minister, you know. He knew, he knew who I was, you know. And, and um, you know, I wish that he would have reached out, um, reached out for help, reached out for something. But, you know, I see that over and over in my life. Like you said, they lose hope. They lose any, any means to go on. They don't have any faith to grab a hold of. They don't have God in their life. They, they uh, you know, in this life without God is, is uh, it can be, it can just be misery, you know? I mean, it can be, and, and that's, that's, and unfortunately, that's what leads to this, to this happening, and, you know, I wish there was a way, I wish there was a better way, but maybe I'm oblivious, I don't know. People, you see people, they say they're okay, they seem happy, they seem like everything's all right, but inside, they're not, and, you know, I don't know how you, I don't know how you look in somebody's heart and, and uh, you know, I'm sure Christ had that ability, but, you know, I just don't have it, you know. I can't look in somebody's heart and say, well, this is where you're at. I mean, I, I wish I could, <laughs> but, uh, but I just can't, you know. And I've had people call me, say, I'm going to commit suicide, I'm going to take my life. I have had that happen. None of them people have ever followed through with it. Um, but like I said, every time this has ever happened to me, it's just really been out of the blue. And, uh, and I don't know. We, uh, like you said, ostracize yourself from God, from the church, from people around you to be an island of your own. Yeah, that's a, that's a bad place to be. You know, we're not designed to be that way. And, and um, anyway, I wish there was a better way, but... Yeah, it does. It takes a lot of courage to confront anybody. We don't, we don't like to be confrontational. Um, but, you know, generally, if we do, if we can, it's better. Um, regardless of the situation, it's better to address it. Um, don't let things fester. Don't. That's what causes us to have anger. That's what causes us to build up inside of us. We need to be able to to talk to people about things. Um, you know, he, Paul says a little bad ruins everything. You know, absolutely, right? Amen. Um, you know, a little bad can ruin everything. You know, if you have a really good day and one bad thing happens, it can ruin your whole day, right? <laughs> you know, one little thing can ruin your whole day. You know, a little bad ruins everything. The church should be pure. The church should be holy. The church has to stand for those things that are holy. We have to stand for God. We have to be on that side. And uh, you can't let what's unholy with what's holy in the Bible. You just can't. It never works that way. Clean, unclean. He says, keep the festival. He's talking about referring this back to the Passover. Not with the old yeast, right? The yeast of malice and wickedness, but with bread without yeast, the bread of sincerity and truth. And he's really referring that back to Passover where they would get rid of all the yeast because uh, it would, you know, leaven stuff, leaven the whole lump. And he's talking about that here, that we have to be pure, that anything bad will breed, and it does, will breed and cause problems. And that once we let that in, uh, it continues to, to get worse, right? Um, Paul says, I've written you in my letter. And see, this is where we know there's more letters to Corinth than what we have. Uh, probably one before 1 Corinthians. We know there's definitely one between 1 and 2 Corinthians. We don't have those letters, so we don't know exactly what was in them. But here he says, not to associate with sexually immoral people. 
And he says, and Paul makes this clear, he doesn't mean the people not in the church. Which is, you know, Paul says the people in the world are in the world, you know. And you have to associate with them because you have to live there. you got to work there. You have to, that's how it is. That's life. Paul says, I'm not talking about the people in the world. I care less about the people in the world, right? Well, maybe that's not the way I should put it. But he says, I don't care about you associating with people that are in the world. He says, what I'm worried about you is doing that with people, your brothers and sisters, in the church, right? He says, no, I don't mean the people of this world, right? Otherwise, you would have to leave, okay? So, in other words, if you couldn't associate with immoral people, you just, you couldn't live in this world. You'd have to just live in a commune, I guess, or something, I don't know. <laughs> you couldn't live in this world, right? But he says, but I'm writing to you that you associate with anyone who calls himself a brother, but is sexually immoral or greedy, an idolater, a slanderer, a drunkard, a swindler, with such a man do not even eat. So, you know, if there, and, and I, you know, like I said, Corinth had big problems, you know. A lot of this, when we look at it, we're like, well, I never had that situation, right, in my life, and hopefully you never will. But Paul here really says, it's the people in the church that I'm worried about. It's not the people outside. He says, what business of mine to judge those outside the church, right? Are you not to judge those inside? God will judge those outside. So the Bible says we're not supposed to judge, but we have to judge, don't we? Isn't that what Paul says here? We have to judge, right? He says you have to judge. You have to do righteous judgment. You have to judge those inside the church. God will judge them outside. You don't have to worry about that, but you have to worry about the inside. You have to worry about the people in here, the people that affect us. Outside, we don't worry about that. God's going to worry about that. I don't have to judge that. I can already tell you it's a sinful world. I don't, I don't need to worry. I don't need to judge that. But I need to judge what's in here, the people in here. And you do too. And we need to hold each other accountable. There's accountability with Christianity. That's part of being a Christian. Accountability. You have to hold me accountable. I expect you to hold me accountable. If you see me doing something you think's wrong, I expect you to tell me. Matter of fact, I'd be upset if you didn't tell me. I want you to tell me. You're not going to hurt me by telling me the truth. If the truth hurts me, then I got a problem. You know, truth is truth. And I'm all right with that. And you should be too. We should be trying to make each other better people. And we can't do that without correcting one another. Because part of being better is correction. Right? Just is. And I need to be corrected sometimes. And you need to be corrected sometimes. And that's okay. And that's okay. As long as we love each other and we do it with love, that's fine. That's exactly the people we need to be. And I'm good with that. I want to be held accountable. Yeah. Well, that's so hard. You know, by, Jesus said, you know, I came to set a father, you know, a mother, you know, a father against the children against their parents and you know, Jesus said, I, you know, it's going to be, it's going to be divisive. It is divisive. And this, this happens. I mean, this, this is a real thing. When you have family members that are also members of the church, then you, and they're involved in something that you don't want to be involved in. That's a whole, that's a big, it's hard, that's a hard thing, brother. I mean, I, you know, Well, it's possible. I have two ways I look at that, you know. One thing is, is that if I disassociate from them altogether, I'm never going to get them back, you know. They're just going to hate me, and I'm never going to get them back. With caution, <laughs> you know. You have, to, you have to be cautious. You have to, number one, you have to let them know that you don't approve of what they're doing. You don't approve of how they're living. You don't approve of what's going on. I think it's the first thing you have to do. You have to say, I do not approve of whatever this is, and I'm not going to, you know. But on the other hand, I love you, and I want you back, and I want, and I want you to be here, and, you know, but I can't condone what you do. And, and I think at that point, it's, it gets tough, you know. They want to come over for Christmas dinner, you know. Well, you know, 
the one hand, you might say, well, I want you to be here. I want to love you. You know, on the other hand, you might want to say, well, I don't think you can come, <laughs> you know. <laughs> so, so I think there's a lot of different ways we can approach it, and every situation is different. And I think that that's one of those times maybe you need to talk to one of your brothers or sisters and say, what should I do? You know, how should I handle this? Um, because I don't think it's always easy to, it's always easy, you know. Every situation you have to, every situation's different. But on the other hand, we never can condone, we never can condone sin. And things we know are sinful. We know is a sinful state. I mean, not one of those things where I think this is wrong or I think this is bad, but one of these cases where we know that's occurring, that's a big thing. And in our society, unfortunately, this is everywhere all the time, right? We live in a world where people have kids and then get married. I mean, you know, we live in a world, we don't live in, we live in that kind of world. So this is something that we, I think is in our face constantly. So um, anyway, maybe didn't give you all a lot of answers, but good class. <laughs> Thanks for your time. <laughs>